everybody here today. Open your Bibles up to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 7 this morning. If you haven't already made your way there, go ahead and do that. We'll be looking at verses 17 to 24 this morning. Uh, as we are be reminded of the, the truth of the calling of God on a believer's uh, life. When we talk about the calling of God, the concept of the calling of God, we, we tend to think of it in a, in a few different ways. Uh, primarily, we, we think of the calling of God uh, in salvation, right? The, the only way that, that any of us uh, could ever believe in Jesus, the only way that any of us could ever uh, know that we need to repent, uh, any of those things that is only because God has called us to be saved, right? That He is the one that does that. But but He also calls us to do more than that. That, that. that once we're called, we answer His call to be saved. He also calls us to to, to live a, a holy lifestyle, to, to live in righteousness. He, he calls us, he, he gifts us and equips us. Then He also calls us to serve, right? Uh-huh. To serve in those, those giftings and, and to, to live out uh, the plans and purposes that he has for each one of us uh, in, in our lives, and, and, I, and I believe that's kind of what Paul was addressing in uh, in our in our passage this morning. That what it means for the people of God, uh, to how we're to live based off of God's calling on our lives, and so what that means is that, that there are people here today, uh, this morning, that have responded to God's calling to be saved. But what that also means is that, that there are some people here that have not yet responded to, to God's calling to be saved. It also means that there are people here today that have already responded to, to, to God's calling to, to serve. To serve in the way that He has gifted you to serve, right? But that also means there are some people here today that are living in disobedience. Mm. That are not serving in the way that God has called you to serve. God has given you a gift. God has equipped you to serve. And God expects you to serve with those gifting. And so my question for you before we get started is which one are you? Right? Which, which one are you? Are you someone that has answered God's calling on your life? Or are you someone that God is still calling? Because be certain of this, He is still calling. That's right. Right? He is calling. Up to this point, as we think about our, our passage this morning and where we're at in chapter 7, uh, Paul has been addressing some issues regarding marriage and divorce, uh, singleness, some of the questions that the Corinthian believers were struggling with. They wrote this letter to Paul, and they, they, they had concerns right, about how they were to live. Sexual immorality was still a huge problem, uh, even within the church. Corinth itself was just ate up with it, right? and I've shared before, not just because you're here uh, today, Edgar, but... but like New Orleans, right? Think about just the, the, the sexual immorality, all, the, all of the sin and degradation. Uh, Corinth was just like that. And, and those things had, had crept in uh, to the church as well because the people were saved out of those things. And now they had a hard time breaking free from those, uh, those issues. And so uh, all this stuff was going on and, 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 and Paul was trying to address that and, and reminding the church that he had called some to marriage, he had called some to singleness, and trying to reconcile all these things. But in the midst of that, I think he's doing more. I think he's wanting to go a little deeper with that and use those as illustrations of how God calls us uh, to many other ways as well. And so that's what I believe we'll see in our passage this morning as we study God's Word together. And so let me encourage you now to grab your Bible and stand with us as we honor the reading of God's Word together. If you don't have one, it'll be on the screen for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 17, the, the Apostle Paul writes, But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. You might want to underline that. Amen. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, rather use it. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. 
This is God's Word. Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've given us. We thank you for your Word before us this morning, God. We thank you for your calling on our lives, the call of salvation, the, the call to live holy lives, the, the call to, to serve your people. God, to, to join you in your mission to, to reach the nations with the good news of Jesus Christ. God, help us. Help us to not only answer your call, but to fulfill your call mm -hmm. in our lives. God, and if there is any here today that have not yet answered your call to salvation, God, I pray that, that today, today would be that, that glorious day. But also, Father, if there are here, those here this morning that are, are still not answering your call, that are living in disobedience and not serving uh, you, not serving your church in the, in the way that you've gifted them to serve. God, I pray that you would stir their hearts up and today they would respond. Mm -hmm. Thank you again, Father, for calling us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you most of all for your Son, Jesus Christ. And we ask these things in His precious name. Amen. Mm -hmm. You may be seated. The first truth that we can pull from our text, truth number one, the calling of God is a perfect calling. It's a perfect calling. We see this uh, based off of uh, verses 17 and 18. Again, Paul says, but as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. It's important for us to remember the, the context, right? It's always, when we're looking at Scripture, remember the context uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of, of the Scriptures. And Paul was addressing some concerns uh, that the Corinthians had. They had written this letter, uh, and apparently uh, there was quite a bit of confusion over how someone's life should be impacted by the Gospel, by becoming a Christian, right? Good, good questions and valid questions, I believe. Uh, in their defense, I, I believe they were a, a very young church, right? They hadn't been around long. They, they, they weren't celebrating their 100th homecoming, right? They, 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 they were a fairly new congregation, fairly new church, fairly uh, immature in the faith, mostly immature believers. And, and they were likely adding new believers on a regular basis, right? The church was exploding and, and growing early on, right? So all this was happening. And, and so... I truly believe that they were doing what they thought was right in God's sight. That they were they were doing what they thought was right. They were they were figuring it out, right? Where we we have scripture before us as our guide. They all they had was the Old Testament. The New Testament was being written, right? They're part of the New Testament, right? right. We look to them and, and see what they did and what they didn't do, the mistakes they made, the success they had. We have that before us as our guide. They didn't have all that, so they're trying to to figure things out. They wanted to, to live holy and consecrated lives before God, and they didn't see how that was possible, for some of them anyway, if they were to remain married to an unbeliever. Right? That's one of the main issues that, that Paul was, was dealing with. They wanted to become more deeply devoted to God, so some of them uh, uh, committed themselves to living lives of celibacy. Again, right, a noble thing. Right? They're, they're trying to, to do what they thought was right. What, what would help them to be a better Christian to be more faithful to God. That's what they're doing. And they would do these things even if God had not called them to that lifestyle. And that's what was happening. Because God does call some believers to a single a single lifestyle, right? They have they have no the, no inclination. They have no desire to become married. No desire to all those things. But for the most part, He does call the rest of us to marriage. So the Corinthian believers were doing the wrong things, but they were doing them for the right reasons. Does that does that make sense? Because I think we do the same thing still today, don't we? Right. We'll, we'll, we'll do the wrong things, but it's for, for the right reasons. They, they did it because they wanted to honor God with their lives. And that's why I believe Paul's response to their concerns, if you look the way things are worded, it's not a harsh rebuke, is it? It's not like what he did with the, with the Galatians. You know, who has bewitched you? He called them, he said they were foolish. Oh, foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? That's not what he does here. It's not a harsh rebuke. They, they didn't need ch a chastisement from Paul. They needed clear and concise answers. Mm -hmm. Clear and concise answers from Paul to help them become the kind of believers that, that truly honored God with their lives. But isn't that what all of us want as the people of God? Mm -hmm. Don't we want that as well? Isn't that why we gather here? 
week in and week out, Sunday mornings, Sunday evenings, where we gather, right? Do, do, do we want answers. We want to, do, do, to learn God's Word. That, that we, 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 we gather to worship Jesus. That's true. We always want to worship Jesus. But we also gather so we can grow in our faith. Right? To grow in our, our faith. We're here to grow in our knowledge and understanding of God's Word. We're here because we all need clear and concise answers from God's Word. Mm -hmm. So we can live those lives the, the way that God wants us to live. Not, not live in ignorance that we won't keep doing the wrong things for the right reasons. See, we can't do the right things unless we know what the right things are. Right. And where do we find those answers? God's Word. That's right. God's Word. That's where we find those answers. God has gifted and called out teachers from among us to help us to grow in our knowledge and understanding of God's Word. Let me just tell you something. For a church this small, God has blessed us. Amen. He has really blessed us with some extremely God-called and God-gifted Bible teachers. And so, what was the root cause of the problems that Paul was addressing here in our passage? Right? What, what was, what was at the, 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 the basis for all these issues? They, they didn't have... A proper understanding, I believe, of the sovereignty of God. Their their view of God was too small. It was too limited. It was too human-like, right? They, they, they thought that God acted and thought and, and, and behaved in the way that humans do. They didn't have a proper understanding of how the calling of God worked in their lives. And, and truth be told, some of us don't have a, a proper understanding of those things either. Right? We don't understand. We, we, we say we have a big view of God, but, but we don't live that way. We, he's small, and, he, and He's not as powerful as we think He is, that, that He can't intervene, that he can't, he can't heal, He can't bring deliverance. Right? We, we just don't think that he can, He's up to the task. That's simply not true. To say that God, that God is sovereign means that God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and that He is in absolute and total control of all things at all times. A small God can't do that. Right. right. Only a big God can. All of God's plans and purposes for His creation are always good and they're always right. Amen. Amen. Even when it, from our perspective, turns out bad. Amen. Right? Even when bad things happen, God is still in control. God never makes the wrong call because God never makes a mistake. Right. He never makes the wrong call because He never makes a mistake. God had made a mistake when He called the people of Corinth to be saved by repenting of their sins and believing in Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. Right? He didn't make any mistakes. God knew precisely who they were. He knew who they were. He knew their past. He knew the, 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 the sins that they had committed. All these things. All the perversity they, that they were involved in. All the immoral ways that they were living their lives when He called them to be saved. That's why He called them to be saved. They need to be saved out of those things. Saved right. from those things. And i got good news for you. God knows that about you too. Amen. Me too. All of us. He knows. God knew all about you and all the ways that you had sinned against Him when He called you to be saved. That's the same reason that He called you to be saved. You need to be saved. And so did I. God never calls the wrong kind of people to be saved. Right? right? There's no such thing. God doesn't make any mistakes. God never calls the wrong kind of people to be saved because God's calling is a perfect calling. God's calling is a perfect calling. God distributes His grace and calls each one of us to be saved at just the right time in just the right place and in the midst of just the right circumstances. Amen. Everything happens for a reason. That's right. Everything. Everything that happens. If it seems as though God had our lives all planned out before we were ever born, if you feel that way, it's because He did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? You're not, you're not crazy. It doesn't just seem like things are falling into place. They are. Scripture testifies to this. David came to understand this as we can tell from what he wrote in Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16. David says this, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book there they were written, the days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. It's almost like God knows, right? That's right. 
God knows. He knows everything. He knows everything about you. He knows everything about me. He knows what you will do. He knows what you won't do. He knows what you're afraid of, what your fears are, right? He knows everything about us. Then he can said this regarding God's calling on our lives. He said, God has an individual plan and purpose for every one of his children. Rest in this. Be at peace in this. When God calls you to salvation through his son, he already had a course for your life mapped out. Right. You see, we're the ones trying to figure things out, right? I just, you know, what am I supposed to do in my life? And, 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 and what's the next steps? You see, we may be confused, but God's not. Right? God is waiting for us to get on board with Him. Right? Well, we make a mess of things and we mess up our lives and we go in the wrong directions. God is never confused like that. It's us. We're the ones who are, 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 are messing things up because we're not following His, His leadership. It didn't matter if the Corinthians were married or single when God called them. It didn't matter if they were circumcised or uncircumcised when God called them either. If they were married, they were to remain married unless they were married to an unbeliever. And that unbeliever wanted out, right? We talked about that earlier. If, if, if they were married to an unbeliever and that unbeliever was okay with living with them and it wasn't an issue, then, then remain, right? To show them grace, uh, model Christ uh, before them. And, and who knows, as Paul said, if you'll, you'll save that unbelieving spouse or not, right? That's a good thing. But if not, if it's going to be difficulty and they're going to make their life hell and, and, and not be able to follow Jesus and, and nothing but problems, if they want out, let them out. Let them depart. Right? And, and that was the exception that, that Paul offered. If they were single, they were to remain single unless they knew that God had called them to become married. If they were circumcised, if they were Jews, they didn't need to stop being Jewish. If they were uncircumcised, if they were Gentiles, they didn't need to become Jewish either. And as we'll also see in this passage, if they were slaves, they didn't need to become free to fulfill God's calling in their lives either. And so the, the question is why? Why would Paul say these things? Because God's calling is a perfect calling no matter who you are or what your circumstances are. That's right. God's calling is, is perfect. It's always perfect. And so how do we apply this to our lives? We need to realize that God knows who we are and He knows where we are. Mm -hmm. He knows who we are and He knows where we are. He sees us. He sees us. He knows what we're going through. He knows what we're dealing with. He knows who He is calling and He knows the circumstance in which He is calling us. Mm -hmm. We need to realize that God created us to be the people that He wants us to be. God didn't make a mistake with you because God doesn't make mistakes. That's right. right. And that, that's kind of pushing back on the culture today, right? Isn't that what's kind of behind all this stuff with gender dysphoria and the trans this and trans that and that God made a mistake and so they're going to fix it, right? That, that I was born in the wrong body. They say things mm -hmm. like that. God doesn't make mistakes. Right. Right. You are who you are because that's who God created you to be. Mm -hmm. We need to realize that God has placed us where He wants us to be so that we'll be able to accomplish what He planned for us to accomplish in eternity past. As David wrote, the days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. Now, to be clear, some, go, some people go too far with that. right? That, that doesn't mean that we're puppets. That doesn't mean that we're just actors that are just following our, our scripts. Otherwise, that would, that would make us guiltless. right? If, 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 I'm a, if I'm sinning, it's because God made me sin. Because, because I'm just following the script, right? That, then some believe that, wrongly. But that's not true. There is ample evidence from God's Word that, that He has given us a free will. Mm -hmm. A free will. A free will to sin against Him or, or, or a free will to believe in Him and to follow Him and to be obedient to Him. And, and yet, in the midst of all this, in His sovereignty, God, by His Spirit, leads us and guides us to walk in the ways that He has set out for us to walk in His Word. Mm -hmm. The Spirit leads us. As God's people, there's some days I, I don't know I don't know why, how I wound up where I wound up. But God does. That's right. I, I don't know I don't know why I, I said the things I said or I did the things that I did, but it's the Spirit of God within me leading me and compelling me to do these things. Paul expressed the 
blessedness of God's perfect calling on the lives of everyone that answered God's call to be saved through believing in His Son this way. In Ephesians 1, verses 3-6, to it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love having predestined, predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. So let me just pause and ask you, have you answered God's calling on your life to be saved? Because that's where it all starts. That's the most, that's the most important call you can answer. Everything else comes after that. Right. If not, would you answer His call and be saved today? Would you? You see, if you've already answered God's call to be saved, are you doing what God has distributed for you to be doing, right? That's what He says, each one. Each one of us, right? He's distributed a, a gift for us. Uh, something to, to serve His body with, to, to advance His mission with. All of us. You say, well, I don't have any gifts. I don't have any spiritual gifts. Then you're not saved. <laughs> right? If you're telling me that, that you're a member of this church and you don't have a spiritual gift, then you should be a member of this church because you're not saved. Only saved people can be a member of this church. In theory. <laughs> in theory. In a perfect world. And so God has gifted you with something. And your gift is not just to occupy a space on a pew. Right. That's, that's not your spiritual gift. Now again, to be clear, we're not saved by good works, are we? That's right. But we're saved for good works. That's right. We're saved for good works. We're saved to do good works. Ephesians 2.10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. See, under, that's another place to underline if you haven't already. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This, uh, this fellow named Simon Kistmaker, I believe. You, you can't see it, but it's a, it's a funny spelling here. He, he said this about how God calls His people in all walks of life. He said the Lord calls His people in all walks of life to follow Him. He wants them to be Christian fathers and mothers, Christian husbands and wives, Christian employers and employees. Each one should fulfill the role the Lord has assigned to him or her, and live accordingly. Mm. Right? He knows who you are. He knows where you are. He, he knows your background. He knows your circumstances. And He wants you to live according to His calling. The calling of God is, is a perfect calling. God never, never, never makes a mistake. That's right. Truth number two, the calling of God is a purposeful calling. It's a purposeful calling. Verses 19 to 22. Again, Paul says, Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling on which he is called. Where you call while a slave, do not be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, rather use it. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. It seems as though Paul may have been addressing another source of underlying tension within the church. Well, we know there were divisions and there were groups that were pitting themselves against one another, but this might be another source of underlying tension that existed, right? That the, the, between the Jews and the, the Greeks. The, the Jewish Christians may have felt a sense of uh, superiority spiritually, right, uh, over the Gentiles because of their background and, and because of their uh, you know, vastly more uh, in-depth knowledge of the Scripture, right? That, that may have been part of it. Likewise, some of the Gentile Christians may have felt spiritually inferior to the Jews. And this was nothing new. Paul had to, uh, had to address this again and again in, in many of his letters, right, on many other occasions. And I can imagine that, 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 that the Christian slaves felt in fear to everyone, right? Everyone, everyone there. Because again, we don't understand. When we, we see about slavery in the Bible and, and a slave in the Greco-Roman world, it's not like colonial slavery. It's similar, but not the same. The slavery that, that, 
that, that we know about here in America and, and the, the way it existed in the ancient world, two different things for the most part. Right. And so you, you'll have here in this congregation, you would have slaves. You would have slaves coming to, to gather with the church to worship with their masters. How awkward is that? <laughs> and so that's another source of tension, a, a, a point of confusion that I guess that Paul is trying to deal with here uh, in, in this text. And so, and so what was Paul's response to those tensions? It, it doesn't, he didn't give them the answer I think that they wanted or, or one that we would want if we asked this question. Circum, he, the answer is this, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. That's right. Right? That's his answer. Right? And for the slaves, he, he told them, don't worry about it. He said, don't be concerned. Don't be concerned with, with about being a slave. And, and so why would Paul say that? Because everyone is equal and has equal value within the family of God. That's right. Amen. That's why. You, again, equality. We're always talking about equality. Within the family of God, the people of God, we're equal. Everyone is equal and has equal value and worth within the family of God. Galatians 3, 27 to 29. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Nobody is superior within the family of God. Mm -hmm. Anyone else. Nobody. Nobody is superior to anyone else because of their ethnicity, because of their gender, because of their social standing or religious background within the body of Christ. We are all one in Christ. We are all the same in that sense. Nobody is superior. So if none of, none of those things matter regarding our calling by God, what does matter? Right, the, the things that matter to us, the things that we use to, to elevate ourselves or put other people down or, or make us seem important and others less important, what, what matters to God according to His calling? And Paul tells us, keeping the commandments is what matters. Doing what God's Word says matters. Being obedient to God's Word is what matters. God's people being obedient to God's Word, that's what matters to God. And so how do we demonstrate that we love God and how do we demonstrate that we belong to His family? We do what Jesus told the disciples in John 14 and John 13, 35. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. And then 13, 35, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You see, church, the calling of God is a purposeful calling. It's a purposeful calling. Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead to atone for the sins of everyone that would ever hear the gospel and turn from their sins and believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Amen. So the greatest purpose, right, of God's calling is the redemption and salvation of sinners. That's the greatest purpose of all. Make no mistake about it. Jewish sinners, Gentile sinners, sinners that are slaves and sinners that are free, male sinners, female sinners, sinners that are rich and sinners that are poor. That's the purpose. That's that great purpose. Redemption and salvation. But there's also another purpose for the calling of God on the lives of the people that responded to His calling to be saved. You know what God does? God uses the people that He saves to call other people to be saved. God uses the people that He saved to call other people to be saved. Unless God has made it abundantly clear that He wants us to, to move away or to change jobs or break off certain relationships, we are to remain in the same calling in which we were called. Now, let me add a little caveat there, because some of you are probably thinking it. But, but what if my situation involves something immoral and lawful or sinful? Don't remain, right? Get out, right? <laughs> that, that, that should be implied, right? That, that He wants you to, to get out of that type of a situation. But other than that, unless... God spells it out in the clouds or makes it abundantly clear. Remain. Remain. Jewish Christians weren't to hide or deny their, that they were Jewish. Instead, they were to embrace it and use it in a way uh, to, to help them to call other Jewish, to, Jewish people to faith in Jesus, right? Who better to, to tell someone about the, the freedom and the grace and the redemption that is only found in Jesus Christ uh, to, to Jews than a Jewish who's come to faith in Jesus Christ? 
Christian slaves weren't to demand their freedom from their masters, even if their masters were Christians too, which was actually quite common in the first century, I imagine. But Paul says, if the opportunity presents itself, free yourself. If the opportunity presents itself, they were encouraged to, to, to do so, to, to free themselves. And, and if they had to live out their days as slaves, they were not to fret over it because they were truly free already in the, in the sense that truly matters the most, right? The, the spiritual sense. They were already free as the Lord's freedmen. They were free from the penalty and the power of their sins. John 8.36 bears this out. It says, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Even if you're a slave, you're still free. You're still free. God has a purpose for calling us to salvation when and where He calls us. God's purpose for calling you to salvation is much bigger than you. It's not just about you. That's right. It's not just about me. God wants to save everyone in your household. Did you know that? If He has already, great. But for the rest of us, he wants to save everyone in our household. And guess what? He wants to use you to do it. Not the, pre not the preacher, not the pastor. Right? God wants to save everyone in your workplace. You say, well, you don't know everybody in my workplace. God does. And he wants to save them. They need to know Jesus. And guess what? He wants to use you to do it. God wants to save everyone in your neighborhood. And he wants to use you to do it. Students, God wants to save everyone in your school. And guess what? He wants to use you to do it. Apostle Paul is a perfect example of this. We see this in 1 Corinthians 9, 19-23. Paul says this, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who were under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law, to those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. So what was the purpose of God calling you to salvation? It was so you could become all things to all people. It was so you could become all things to all people. It was so that you might, by all means, save some. As Christians, we, we, we all have the same purpose as the Apostle Paul. And what was Paul's purpose? Well, what's our purpose? To fulfill the Great Commission. Right? To fulfill the Great Commission by making disciples of all nations. So I would just ask you, are you fulfilling the purpose that God has called you to fulfill? That, that, that great purpose. Keeping the commandments of God. That's what matters to God, isn't it? Making disciples of all nations. Right? That, that's, that's a big part of obedience. Making disciples of all nations is included in keeping the commandments of God. The Great Commission is not optional. That's right. It's a command. Right? It's not if you feel like it or when it's convenient. Would you, would you please make disciples? Hmm. No, it's make disciples. That's an imperative. That's a command. If you're one of the, those people that, that's always searching for your purpose in life. I mean, some of you know. Y'all been bouncing from thing to thing to thing and and it just like you're always moving around, and I just can't seem to find my purpose. God already has your purpose. He's already, you need to get on board with Him. Amen. And now you know. You can leave here this morning knowing what your purpose is. If you didn't know what your purpose was before today, now you do. You're welcome. Your search is over. The calling of God is a purposeful calling indeed. Number three, the calling of God is a permanent calling. A permanent calling. Verses 23 and 24 says, You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in that state to which in which he was called. A few weeks ago we were reminded that the calling of marriage is a permanent calling, right? That's that's God's plan, that's his purpose in marriage, that's the design. God's design for marriage is for one man and one woman to remain faithful to one another and 
in their marital vows until death, right? Until death do we part. When we say until death do we part, that's what God means, right? That's right. Until one of us is gone. That's the design of marriage that God has given us. A few weeks ago, we were also reminded that the covenant of marriage represents the covenant that we make with God and God makes with us when we answer His call to be saved, right? It's, 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 it's uh, emblematic or it represents that, that same covenant. When we repent of our sins and believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, we're saying yes to the bridegroom. And we instantly and permanently become part of the bride of Christ. And it's only by grace and through faith that we permanently belong to God as His adopted sons and daughters. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 makes this clear. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, then not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So when God calls us to Himself to be saved and adopted into His forever family, His calling is a permanent calling. It's not temporary. Right? That, that, that we don't just join His family temporarily. Uh, he doesn't covenant with us. We don't just become His sons and daughters on a temporary basis. It's permanent. And, and so how is this possible? It's only possible because we are bought with a price. Mm -hmm. Bought with a price. Notice the, it, it's past tense. It, it's already happened. Bought with a price. Back in verse 21, Paul mentioned that if the believers that were slaves could be made free, they should do it. They could purchase their freedom or someone else could. That was a, a possibility in those days. In that case, they were only purchasing their physical freedom because Jesus had already purchased their spiritual freedom. Uh, that's the point that Paul was, was making. Their, their, their spiritual freedom had already been purchased through His death and resurrection. But even if physical freedom never came, they were already free in Christ. And therefore, they should not live as if they were still slaves of men anymore. Right? Don't, don't make yourself slaves of men is what Paul says. What, why, why did, what, what did Paul mean by that? And Danny Aiken, again, gives a good explanation in his commentary on this passage. He said this. He says, Your social status according to human standards now means nothing. Zero. Not. As a new creation in Christ, don't be enslaved to shame as a slave or enslaved to pride as a freed man. Don't be enslaved to the opinions of man because they don't matter. Christ is Lord and, he, and, and who He says you are is what counts. Find your identity, value, and worth in Jesus Christ. So you might be sitting here wrestling with all these concepts that we're looking at today and you might be confused. Uh, are we Christ's slaves or are we God's sons and daughters? You ready for the answer? Mm. No. Yes. <laughs> yes, the answer is yes. We are Christ's slaves because we have been bought at a price. We belong to Him because He purchased our freedom from sin, death, and hell by shedding His blood and laying down His life in our place on the cross. First Peter 1, 18 and 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from the aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. But you see, it's also true that we're God's sons and daughters. We're also God's sons and daughters because of what Ephesians 1, 5 said earlier that we have been adopted as sons and daughters by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. In other words, we are His sons and daughters. We have been adopted according to God's permanent calling. His permanent calling. What a privilege it is to be a slave of Christ and a son or daughter of God. Amen? Amen. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. It's not a right. It's a privilege. Do you know what the best part of both is? They're permanent. <laughs> They're permanent. That, that's what, that's what makes it so awesome. They, they, don't, they don't go away. Jesus didn't make a down payment on our freedom. He bought it outright. Mm -hmm. He bought it outright. Some of y'all know what that's like. The, 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 there is no debt. There's nothing more. Some, <coughs> some of you have, have so much uh, money that you can just walk into a car dealership and just buy it outright. I'm not that person. <laughs> right? I'm making notes. I'm having to finance. But you see, with, with, with God... With Jesus, there is no more. It's paid in full. 
Our sin debt is paid in full, right? He bought us outright, bought our freedom outright. And God didn't just take us in on a trial basis to see how it would work out. And if you behaved, He would keep you. And if you got bad, He would bring you back. That's not what happened. When He adopted us, guess what He did? He adopted us just as we were. Right? Sight, you know, this is it. Again, the car analogy. As seen. Right? You buy it as is. He purchased us as, as we were, but He doesn't leave us like we were, does He? He makes us something new. Romans 8, 38, 39 talks about the permanence that we have in His calling. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. The calling of God is a permanent calling. Let us remain with God, what Paul says. Let us remain with God. So this morning as we close, I just ask you, what have you done with God's calling on your life? What have you done? Have you responded to God's calling on your life to be saved? Have you done that yet? If not, today is a great day. Today is a great day for that. Any, any day that you would turn from your sins, any day that you would place your faith in Jesus is a great day. Amen. It's a great day for you. It's a great day for us. It's a great day for the kingdom of God. But you see, today is the only day that we're, we're, we're promised. Right now is the only time that we know that we have. And again, I'm not... This isn't a scare tactic. Because sometimes that's what preachers like to do. We try to scare the hell out of people. But that don't work. Right? It don't work. It don't last. And Stacy, we mentioned that in Sunday school this morning. But what I am trying to do is letting you... Is reminding you of the urgency. Right? We, we don't know what's going to happen later. You may not be able to respond later. You can have a stroke later, and that's it. Your brain don't function anymore. Right. You can just start breathing for no reason whatsoever. So right now is the only time that, that we know that you have. The only time you know that you have is now. If God is calling you today, you hear His calling, today is the day to be saved. Second Peter 3, 9 tells us that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Guess what? I'm not one that any should perish either. Not if I can help it. Now, I don't save anybody. You don't either. That's right. But I got my part. That's right. It's my job to communicate the truth of God's Word, to share the Gospel, to call you to repent, call you to believe, call you to be faithful, to do what matters to God and keep the commandments. Right? But God is the one that does the saving. Is God calling you to be saved today? If so, it's time to say yes. Mm -hmm. It's time to say yes. Paul tells us how to say yes to God's calling in Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Would you be saved today if that's you? Mm. The calling of God is a perfect calling, isn't it? Mm -hmm. He knows who you are. He knows where you are. The calling of God is a purposeful calling. He's got a, a purpose for calling you. That's no accident. It's no accident. It's not a coincidence. He has a purpose for calling you. The calling of God is a permanent calling. Once you belong to God, you belong to Him forever and nothing and nobody shall be able to separate you from Him ever. That's right. Amen. Ever. So if you need to repent today, need to be saved today, if you need to be obedient to, to, to God's calling on you, if you're already saved and you're living in disobedience and you're just, you're one of the ones that say, well, I just don't, I don't think I have a gift and I don't, you know, I just, I, I can't serve. I, I don't bring no value to this church and I'm just doing the best I can. That's the devil. Amen. God has gifted you. God has equipped you. God has placed you here in this church to serve this church. Mm 
If he wanted you to serve at another church, he'd send you to another church. He sent you here. Mm -hmm. Serve here. Use your giftings here. Help us to grow. Help us to reach the nation with the gospel. Amen? Amen. Right. Let me pray. We'll have a chance to respond. Father, we do thank you for your word to us today. God, that's another one of those passages that, that, that might be kind of confusing and there are some things that are said and the that are kind of a paradox for us. But God, I, I pray and I trust that your spirit would, would make things clear to us where, where maybe I misspoke and maybe I said something that, that made things less clear than they should be. God, I, I trust and I pray that your spirit would make those things clear. But God, what is clear is that, 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 that you have called us, that you're the one who calls us to salvation, you're the one that calls us uh, to, to, to serve within your church. You're the one that, that, that calls us to, to, to move around and uproot our families and, 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 and change jobs and all these different things. Not just for our benefit, but for the, the benefit of the gospel. For the mission. That you will make us and use us as missionaries if we will answer your calling. So, Father, I pray first and foremost for those here this morning that have heard the call to be saved. If there be any here this morning, God, I pray that you would give them the courage to step out and say, I want to follow Jesus. I need to be saved. Help them to repent. Help them to believe in your Son, Jesus, as Lord and Savior. And then help them to do what matters. Help them to, to obey the commandments. And Father, for the rest of us, I pray that you would help us to examine our hearts today. Are, are we doing what you've called us to do? Are we being who you've called us to be? And if not, God, help us to make some corrections. Help us to repent. And help us to be the individual believers that you've called us to be. But help us to be the church. Help Occupy Two Baptist Church to be the church that you've called us to be too. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.